Well, thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to come here to speak today. I've learned a huge amount already. <laughs> I'm still learning. Um, it's been an honour and a privilege to listen to some of the experts in their field. Uh, clearly, the volume of work that I've dealt with in terms of ocular melanoma is tiny in comparison. I've seen less than 10 patients this year with ocular melanoma. But my interest is very much in liver metastatic disease, so uh, dealing with tumours within the liver. Uh, and ocular melanoma plays a part in that. This is a good old-fashioned radiologist. Now, clearly, we've moved on since that time. Uh, I'm not going to tell you about ocular melanoma, uveal melanoma. You know all about that. I'm not here to tell you about that. Uh, but just to say, um, it occurs in young people, average age of diagnosis 55, so relative to the other tumour types we deal with, that's a, a young age. Um, it's rare, as we know, and that leads to problems. Clearly, um, the management of the primary tumours is, is focal within... Uh, a few centres which have huge expertise, but we need to think of a group about how we make sure the ongoing care of, of patients uh, following their uh, initial treatment is uh, uh, clearly pathwayed and managed. Um, in terms of my interest uh, and liver metastatic disease, it's, uh, I think, fair to say there's a uh, tendency for hematogenous spread, so blood-borne spread of tumours to the liver. I'm not sure if anyone knows why. Clearly, I don't know why. Um, there are no lymphatics for the eye, and therefore, the, as we've said before, the nodal spread of tumours, which is common in other tumour types, doesn't occur, occur in this condition. So the majority of patients with ocular melanoma, when they present with metastatic disease, 90% of those, it'll be within the liver. 50% uh, of patients uh, with melanoma... Uh, will develop um, metastatic disease. Now, that is very dependent on tumour biology, on tumour size, on the initial management, and clearly uh, there's a lot of work being done to try and triage patients so we have a clear understanding of how that patient is likely to progress as they move forward. So that has a huge impact on how you're advised uh, and also how you follow those patients up. Um, I think it's true to say that metastatic disease at presentation is very uncommon. I'm not sure that's right or not. Uh, which implies that um, the metastatic disease must be in the liver, um, it's a philosophical point really, uh, from that stage to the stage at which people present. Uh, now in terms of the liver, what is the liver? Well, the liver is the largest solid organ in the body. Um, it has a large amount of the circulating blood volume residing within it, that's uh, important for Neil or important for the surgeons. Uh, and it's a, uh, both a power plant and a waste disposal unit for the body. It produces a huge amount of uh, vital proteins uh, for the body, but also <laughs> detoxifies uh, different drugs and metabolites and alcohol, as we know. The odd thing is you only need a small amount of your liver to be working well, and that's where Neil comes in. You only need a small amount of your liver to be working well to survive. Uh, as I've said, the other, the other roles, we look at the specific roles of the liver. It stores things, stores vitamins. Uh, it has a sort of blood filtering uh, system, so it destroys uh, damaged uh, blood cells. It detoxifies things, so drugs and alcohol fit into there, and it secretes. It secretes bile into, into the GI tract. That's the yellow pigment that it secretes into the, the GI tract. Where I come in, we need to look at the uh, anatomy of the liver. So the important things from my perspective to have a handle on are the fact that we'll ignore the green plumbing. The green plumbing is the bile. The bile's going south into your, into your gut. The two other bits of plumbing, the liver's fairly, well, is unique in having two blood supplies. It's got a dual blood supply. The bit of blood that the liver likes is the blood coming back from the gut. That's coming up the vein, the blue structure there. That's got all the goodies in it. So it's got all the uh, nutrients in, in that you've digested in the bowel, and it's also got uh, quite a lot of other trophic things. Those are cytokines, things released by the pancreas and other areas in the GI tract. That's the blood the liver loves. The artery to the liver is actually a fairly small, fiddly affair. Uh, it says 25% of the blood supply. It's probably even less than that. It can be down to 10%. Um, and as Neil talked earlier, the old battle surgeons, you know, we go back to Napoleonic Wars and other things, used to just clamp the artery. And people survive with their artery clamped because they've got a good big blood supply here from the, the portal vein. The nice thing for me is that the artery is very important for tumours and it's not so important for normal liver. And what I mean by this, this is actually a graph from a different tumour type, a hepatocellular cancer, but the same, it's an arterialised tumour. So tumours in the liver which are spread from uh, a melanoma have a very rich blood supply coming from the arterial inflow. <coughs> Below the graph is blood supply coming from the portal vein. That's the big 
the big vein, above the line is arterial blood supply. So most of the blood gets its normal blood supply, the healthy blood, all from the portal supply. Whereas the tumours <coughs> get almost all their blood inflow, arterial inflow, from the, the artery. So that gives us an ability to start targeting those areas because we know that they'll have a much stronger predominance of arterial inflow. Um, just as some thoughts, early detection of metastases is mandatory if you're going to get good outcomes. Now we can be nihilistic and say oh, the treatments don't work that well, therefore it's not important to detect patients early. I think that's five years old in terms of philosophy. I think you know, we're all clear that if you can detect people with small volume disease, they'll do better. You also can then triage them all together, put them into cohorts, put them into trials, and then work out the best way of managing those patients. So I think you know, early detection is, is, is important. At the moment, we don't have any comparative data to show which is the best method of picking up uh, uh, melanoma deposits within the liver, although I can talk to you about my personal preference and understanding. Um, it is said, so the Liverpool experience in that trial, uh, my understanding was you were doing biannual MRs in high-risk patients. So they're triaging patients with very high risk of relapse and then using what I would see as the best test to try and detect relapse in those patients, which seems eminently sensible. It's important when you start out your treatment pathway to have an imaging test, I think. And now the reason for that is if you come and see me and you've got pain and you have a scan and you're like poor old Hal here with a bum of a birthmark, you're going to be thinking that you've got a lump in your liver. Well, I've got about four or five lumps in my liver. Um, they're very common to have birthmarks, to have other kind of focal abnormalities in the liver, very common. So it's very useful to have a baseline scan on someone so that when they come back and have a follow-up scan or when they come back with symptoms, you can compare the two. If something has evolved in that time, then clearly that's much more worrying. So you can be, mis you can be misled. If you haven't had an imaging as a baseline, an imaging test as a baseline, um, that can really hamper you when you move forward. What do I see as the best way of thinking? Well, I want to be like this guy here. You know, poor old Julian here. Julian, you're cheating. Well, the way of cheating is to use the best test you've got. The best test we've got is MR. I don't think there's any debate about that. We can debate how you, you know, the intricacies of MR scanning. Um, there's the ability to use fancy contrast agents. These are agents that are taken up by healthy liver. Um, and not taken up by tumours deposits in the liver, and they make tumours more evident in the liver. Now, you wouldn't use that as a screening test because there are side effects of the drug, there are cost implications and everything else. Whether or not we should be doing this for patients in terms of surveillance, well, I think we would have to look at finding people at very high risk of recurrence um, to make that a sensible um, pathway. Um, CT is our mainstay of cancer follow-up imaging in most other tumour types in cutaneous melanoma. Is that right, Christian? So mm. CT is actually a very accurate test. And now with the modern scanners, the uh, multi-slice scanners, and with contrast that you inject into the, into the vein, the ability to pick up small tumours um, is undoubtedly there with cross-section imaging. Ultrasound is a difficult test. Done well, it probably has the same sensitivity as a lot of these other tests done poorly it has very limited value and it's not so reproducible so for the vast majority of tumor types that i deal with so upper gi cancers we've moved over to using ct as the mainstay of imaging or surveillance and then occasionally mr for troubleshooting <coughs> but we could certainly discuss that later this was just an angiogram just to show you what i do i spent my whole life putting little catheters in people's arteries this is an image of someone's uh, liver here so i've got the catheter here into the blood supply of the liver the blood supply is a bit like a tree, arborizes, so it breaks down into lots of little branches. And what you find is tumours like this have a very rich blood supply. So they're going black because I'm injecting black contrast, x-ray dye, and the tumour is taking it up and going black. What I can then do is I can put in particles that block the blood supply, and it goes from being a light bulb to on this image, you've lost all your tumour blood supply. You aim to maintain the normal blood vessels in the liver. So you don't have an impact on the background liver, you just have an impact on the tumour. In terms of the treatments we offer via the artery, or the ones that I offer, there are two main groups. There are what we call chemoembolisation. So chemotherapy drug and blocking the blood vessel, chemoembolisation, or radioembolisation, or some people call it Certex, that's a trade name, uh, which is where we put radioactive particles into the liver and embolise. The embolic effect from Certex is much less. It's really delivering a high dose of... of, of of radiotherapy to the liver. 
But in terms of uh, key mobilization, old-fashioned key mobilization, we used to perform up to about 2006, we used to mix chemotherapy drugs with an oily contrast agent. We used to make a sort of emulsion, a bit like a salad cream. Uh, we'd inject it in, and um, we got a reasonable response to that. The problem was people got the same systemic side effects that they would if you gave them intravenous chemotherapy, and that's because the, the chemotherapy wasn't held for long within the tumour before it leached out into the normal circulation. The game's moved on. This has all been driven by colorectal cancer and hepatoma treatment, but we now have these particles which actually pull in chemotherapy agents in the uh, pharmacy when they're, when they're making these particles up. You can then inject them into the tumour, and then when they're in the tumour, you give that tumour, number one, you, you block its blood supply, so you make it ischemic, and number two, you allow the chemotherapy to leach out. So it gets a sort of double hit. It, it's firstly made ischemic, loses its blood supply, and then it gets a high, very high dose of chemotherapy. And the advantage to that is uh, the intratumoral dose is much, much higher. The systemic dose is much, much lower, so the side effects are minimal. Okay. In terms of why would we want to do a, what we call a local regional therapy? Why would we want to treat just the liver? Well, the sort of parameters we have are that the systemic treatment shouldn't be great, otherwise we would use that as the first line. The liver should be the dominant or the only site of involvement. There's no point in just treating the liver if you've got disease elsewhere and not having systemic treatment. And there should be a need to control the disease in terms of improving survival or giving palliation. So I would say ocular melanoma or uveal melanoma fits the bill almost entirely. <coughs> now, Neil's talked about how if you have small volume disease and it's in the right areas in the liver, we can resect it. One of the other ways we can get rid of tumours is good old-fashioned cautery. This has, you know, been around for centuries. Um, we're talking about using thermal energy, using heat normally. Uh, what we can do is we can put a probe either through the skin or Neil can do it at the time of operation into a tumour, so a lump in the liver. And you can then deliver energy, you can deliver a high dose of energy, and that causes cooking, actually thermally injures that bit of the liver. The problem with this technology is like my dad's barbecue. My dad can never, my dad says you can't burn a banger. Well, he's wrong. I mean, you know, he cremates anything he puts on his barbecue. And what happens is you get carbon, you get that black stuff, forms around the probe tip, and then you can't get the energy any further out into the liver. All you're doing is you're using a very high current you have a very big surface area at one end, so there's no thermal heating at this end, and a pinpoint at that end, so you get the heating all at the, uh, the tip of the probe. The companies have spent a vast amount of money developing technologies to make the amount of liver that you can damage in one go, i.e. the tumour you can kill in one go bigger by developing different probe designs. But uh, the, the problem is the heat does sort of dissipate out towards the edge of any lesion. Um, there are... Other technologies, thermal injuries, the new kid on the block is microwave ablation. Now all these technologies can be used in any tumour in the liver. Uh, microwave ablation has the benefit that you can actually damage or you can thermally injure a larger area of the liver in one go than you can with microwave. But the technologies are comparable. And this is just to show you an idea. Uh, so on these slides here, there's a, there's a sort of blushing area high up there in the liver. I'm not tall enough to show you exactly where. These are the probes, the tines of the probes opening out, a bit like an umbrella. You then injure that bit of the injure, so that bit of liver there is injured and is dead effectively, it's necrotic, and then over time that will involute and shrink down. So that's the advantage of ablative technologies. Ablative technologies are only really applicable, though, when you have a handful of tumours. You know, three, four, five would be about the most um, that would be appropriate for. Now, I've got a video loop here. I think it's too gory. This is about 10 years old. This is very old technology. The reason I show you this is it gives you a handle on both what an angiogram is. So this is someone's groin. This is a needle going into the artery in the groin. And then someone puts a little wire in through the artery in the groin. And that comes all the way up, up into the big blood vessel, up into the aorta. Having got into the aorta, you can turn right and you can get into the artery of the liver, the hepatic artery. And when you're in there, you then have the ability to put in either bland particles, plus particles to block the blood supply. These are very old-fashioned, these are bland PVA. You can put in the drug eluting beads we were talking about, or you can put in the, the, the particles radioembolization, so the particles which have the radioactivity embedded within them. So you inject through a syringe, you've got a catheter that runs up here, that's a fine bit of tubing that runs up there, and that runs all the way out into someone's liver. I mean, this is very, this is like something out of Blake 7 to me, this is definitely from the... <laughs> <laughs> This is someone injecting something here, and they must have had good eyesight, but when they've injected, they've got that white area there, which is a bit like a light bulb to us. That shows that you've got all those particles in that tumour. I think that's... 
<laughs> Someone's <laughs> not the most professional department of Southampton. <laughs> so this is a probe. So these are really just like uh, they're small. They're, they're like big needles, effectively. And the top of these, the tip of these, will get very hot. And what you do is you use a scanner, normally an ultrasound scanner, and you find the tumour. Once you've found the tumour. The patient's asleep. You're then going to advance the needle. They'll come in from that corner, and you're aiming to get them down in. There you go. So straight into the actual area there. And you can then deliver a large amount of energy, thermal energy to that area, and actually kill that area of the liver. Um, good. Now, we've seen a lot of evidence this morning. I think it a bit <laughs> thin on evidence. The evidence for chemoembolization, so that's putting in particles with chemotherapy drugs into the liver, is... Uh, patchy, if I'm honest. These aren't randomised trials. They're not big numbers of patients. What seems to, if you look through the data, there does seem to be an improvement as we've moved from the old-fashioned oily chemoembolic agents to the new drug-eluting bead chemoembolics. Uh, and as stated earlier, there does seem to be uh, survival rates over about a year for most people following uh, management with this treatment. The problem is you have to be very careful of these. They're not randomised trials. They're not taking groups of comparable patients, looking at them, one arm having this treatment, one arm not having this treatment. So drawing down any you know, hard and fast evidence from this is, is, is difficult. One thing I would say, and it's become apparent in my practice, uh, surtexing people's livers uh, for, for, for ocular melanoma, there are two groups of patients. You get the patients who have lumps in their liver. These are lumps I can see. They're like golf balls. If you have lumps in your liver, you'll do much, much better with our liver-specific therapies, with our uh, treatments. If you have this, if you have a diffuse pattern of disease, lots of little things like Miller-y pattern of disease, and that probably comes back to the talk about laparoscopy. When you, we scan people and we don't see much on scanning, and then someone looks in with a telescope and they can suddenly see little bits like rice, hence the Miller-y term, all over the surface of the liver, those patients do much worse. Uh, so what you're looking for is you're looking to pick up patients with nodular disease, hopefully palsy nodules, i.e. a few nodules, um, to treat. In terms of, um, there was some mention earlier about the CERTEX data. The CERTEX data, um, the latest paper, so from this year, taking 32 patients, uh, mean your overall survival 10 months, sounds pretty awful. What you have to realise, though, those are patients that have been pre-treated with either uh, TACE, so chemoembolisation, or with immunoembolization in America, and they've failed those treatments. So we're, we're taking the worst group of patients, patients who have got tumors in their liver, they've then had a treatment, that treatment's not worked, and then we're trying another treatment. So I think in that group of patients, the 10 month has to be taken uh, in light. I think that's actually not a bad outcome. We don't have randomized data yet for CERTEX, but I, if I've got a couple of minutes, I'll just explain how CERTEX works, just in case uh, people are interested. Surtex, people talk about radioembolization. Now, I think that's a misnomer. It's not radioembolization, really. It's really a high dose of radiation to liver tumours. We know these tumours in the eye are particularly radiosensitive, I think, as my understanding, certainly listening to what I heard from earlier. Uh, so there's a, there's a logic to treating these uh, tumours with a, uh, a high dose of radiotherapy. We're talking about beta emitters. So those from uh, medical school days or physics days are electrons, aren't they? Am I right in saying they're electrons? Yeah. They're like electrons. They're big, heavy things. So they don't go very far, but they give out a lot of energy. And there's an advantage to that. If you put those inside a tumour, they'll have a big destructive effect locally. They won't cause damage in the surrounding liver. They're unlikely also to have a, a health implication for people around that patient. The half-life, about three days. We do it by doing two procedures. There's what we call a workup procedure. And what we do in the workup is we actually isolate the liver. We get all the blood vessels that are going close to the liver or taking blood away from the liver and block them off with little platinum coils. So we have a liver in isolation. It's like a tree. You've got a trunk of a tree going up into a, into a liver. That's what you want. Then you know if you put the particles in, they're only going to end up in one place. And that's important to us and important to anyone that has this treatment done. Um, what we do then is we put in a, a tracer particle and we then scan them and see where those tracer particles have ended up. If they've ended up in the tumours, great. We know that's going to work well. If they end up shunting through the tumours and into someone's lungs, which are particularly radiosensitive, then you have to start to think, is this treatment the right treatment for them? You normally then bring the patient back a couple of weeks later and you do another angiogram, so same type of procedure. This time all you're doing is parking the catheter there and slowly infusing the uh, radiation dose. Um, in terms of um, the doses that tumours get, 
because of this dual blood supply the liver has, um, we know that the liver is actually quite radiosensitive. It doesn't like having doses of radiation to it. So you would have thought initially this wasn't a great way of treating patients, but actually because the tumours have such a rich arterial blood supply, they suck up all the surtex, so the tumours get a very high dose. They get doses over 100 grade, they got massive doses, whereas the background liver gets a very small dose. Um, so this uh, seems to work well. These are angiographic images, and what they're showing is this is the blood supply to the liver. This is the one we're interested in. This is a blood vessel going south of the liver. This is one we don't want the particles to go into. So we'd block that vessel off, and that's a, a gastric artery, a blood vessel to the stomach that comes from the liver. So we want to block that as well. So I then spend a bit of time, and what we do on the workup, and it takes about um, two, three hours, we actually block these blood vessels either using plugs, um, which are uh, either made of platinum or titanium, you get into a blood vessel you want to block, you allow it to expand, then all you do is literally unscrew that device and leave it sitting there. And so that blocks off that blood vessel and it stops the blood escaping or stops potentially those particles escaping from the liver into other blood vessels. And we also use these coils. These are little coils that you can pack down into a tight ball and they're covered in a sort of fibrin uh, which is thrombogenic. It forms blood clot around it. You might wonder why these patients don't get symptoms from having blocked those blood vessels. Well, actually, what happens is blood vessels open up from below or from other arteries, arterial arcades. So you don't get ischemia, you don't get damage to organs by this. You're just, you're just like a roadblock, you're redistributing the blood. We then do these scans in nuclear medicine. I call them blobograms, they look pretty unpleasant, they're just little black blobs. But what they do is they tell you where your particle's going to end up. And occasionally you get one like this. This is a patient that we were going to treat, and they suddenly said, oh, there's a dose over here, so you can't treat them. I have to say, you know, it's very hard to know with such a fuzzy image, are they right or not? They were why there was uptake within the stomach there. Uh, we've got a technique that we use called DynaCT. When I do an angiogram, we actually get the machine to spin around a few times, and it generates these three-dimensional models. And the great thing about this is, when I inject something, the contrast is white. Anything that goes <coughs> white has got in its blood supply from where I'm treating. So I can put the hairpins on there, and I suddenly realise that bit they were seeing is actually a sliver of the liver that was hanging up underneath the uh, heart and on the other side. So then I knew that patient was treat safe to treat. So this is all about our technology evolving to make this treatment as safe as possible. <coughs> and sometimes when we do it, this is me doing another angiogram just before Certex, I block the blood vessels off, and I thought there's some squiggly blood vessels here. And when I did that fancy technique again, I suddenly saw this white stuff all around the lining of the stomach. So somehow the blood was getting from here into that patient's stomach. And that would be a disaster because they would get severe side effects from that. And when I went looking up into the branches of the liver, I suddenly got into this tiny twig of a branch and that's the dominant blood supply to their, liver, to their stomach. So that was a useful bit of information to get because we managed to block it off. And this is what the treatment looks like. That's certex, that's the vial of, uh, of the particles in there. It's all in this Perspex box to project me and the staff around to make sure we don't get a dose. You connect, this is the catheter that goes up into the groin, into the arteries of the liver. We slowly infuse the particles up. <coughs> they come through the line, up into the patient's liver. Once in the patient's liver, that's perfect. Number one, that the dose is then shielded from everyone else by the patient's skin and bones and everything else. And number two, that's where we want it to be. That's where it works. In terms of side effects, most people after an, an embolization procedure, whether it be chemoembolization or Certex, feel lousy for at least a week, feel off colour, uh, loss of appetite, maybe a mild pyrexia. Abdominal pain is common and nausea are common. Often they're self-limiting, normally less than 24 hours, 24, 48 hours. So I treated a patient yesterday, he got absolutely no symptoms, he went home this morning. It's variable according to the dose you give though. And you can get a transient rise in your liver function test, that's normally only transient. In terms of the, the big things that we worry about, the big things we worry about are getting the particles into the blood supply of the stomach or the duodenum, and that can cause ulceration, and that's a, a major complication. Pancreatitis is rare. Cholecystitis, I have seen, uh, and can be a problem, and can even occasionally, uh, rarely require a cholecystectomy. Uh, radiation pneumonitis, this damage to the lungs, now doesn't occur because we did the shunt study, so we make sure the stuff isn't going to the lungs before we treat people. Radiation-induced liver disease is a, a condition which occurs because you're given too big a dose of radiation to the liver. Um, so normally that's a dosing phenomenon, or the fact the patient's got a damaged liver and you haven't appreciated that. In, this, in, in ocular melanoma, it's probably not such a problem. We see it much more in patients with colorectal cancer who've had lots of biological agents, lots of chemotherapy regimes, and actually those chemotherapy regimes have damaged their liver even though it's not been appreciated, and then you give them another insult on top of it. 
So, which modality do you treat? Well, it'd be nice to have a, a, a evidence base and a clear pathway of which treatments work best. It depends, though. I think the things you would break it down into are the amount of disease you have, the amount of liver disease you have, and then you want to break it down to the biology. How far are you out from the original uh, the tumour detection, the, the, the primary tumour detection, and a little bit of an insight into the biology of the tumour and the natural history of it, because that will determine the most appropriate treatment for those patients. If you've got small volume disease, then the ablative technology, so surgical resection or ablation would be the most appropriate treatment for those patients, because you can effectively render them so that you've got no visible disease uh, visible in their liver. When you've got multiple small tumours, then surgery and ablation become less promising, and then I think the majority of people in the UK would then be looking at chemoembolisation or uh, surtex. Now, drug eluting beads, and I think chemoembolisation is an old technology, drug eluting <coughs> beads will be have taken over from uh, old fashioned chemoembolisation. You have to be mindful, though, as the disease volume progresses, you have to be more and more cautious because you, you can't, number one, the benefit accrued to treating those patients will be less, and number two, the side effects or risks will be greater. And that's the onus, I think, on us detecting disease at an earlier stage. So I think the choice of treatments should be based on the amount of disease, on the amount of um, involvement, and, uh, yeah. And I think the follow-up, and that's going to be critical in detecting early disease, will improve, hopefully, a survival. We clearly need trials to prove that. Okay. That's meant to be a liver. It doesn't look that much like a liver, does it? <laughs> now, I know that's a very crude run-through of um, lots of different areas. And I've not um, purposefully touched on too much science. Is there anything anyone would like to ask us? You all want to go home, don't you? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you